throughout this course, we've talked about how the Bible does not outrightly condemn slavery. We've seen Jesus use slaves and masters throughout his parables. We've seen Paul use the metaphor of slave and master as a metaphor for our relationship with God. And we've seen Paul write a letter to one master about one particular slave of his. But no survey of the New Testament attitudes on slavery would be complete without looking at the instances where slaves and masters are directly addressed as regards their station in life. Toward the end of Paul's letter to the Ephesians, Paul addresses church leaders and members, husbands and wives, children and their parents. He gives advice to all of them as to how they are to conduct themselves in their various roles. And then he addresses slaves and their masters. Slaves Heed your fleshly lords as though Christ, with reverence and trembling in your heart's simplicity, not by affecting slavishness before people's eyes like someone obsequious to human beings, but as slaves of Christ doing God's will from the soul, slaving with a good will as though for the Lord and not for human beings, knowing that whatever good thing each man does, this will be rewarded him by the Lord, whether a slave or a freeman. And lords, do the same to them, refraining from making threats, knowing that both their Lord and yours is in the heavens, and with him there is no respecting of persons." At this point in the 21st century, Christians specifically and humanity in general are united on the immorality of slavery. It's not a question that we argue about these days at all, and it shouldn't be. It's wrong, evil, obviously. But the 17th and 18th century proponents of slavery in the southern states didn't have to obviously look too deeply to find biblical justification for their position. All they had to do was look at texts like this from Ephesians to find support for the institution of slavery and to find support for keeping slaves right where they were and working hard. Here's what I'll say about this text, though. Whatever it is, it isn't part of an argument for keeping slavery or denouncing slavery. There is no such theological argument in the New Testament because the authors could probably not even imagine a world without it. It was not a hotly debated topic in the ancient world. There were hotly debated topics, but this wasn't one of them. Slavery was a given, so they didn't challenge it. As I've said before, I wish they had. Texts like this today are kindling for some people to denounce the Bible and anyone who reads it. It's easy for someone to hold up one of these sections and say, look at how backward and primitive this book is. How can anything good come from it? And we find almost identical sections in Colossians, 1 Timothy, Titus, and First Peter, texts which tell slaves to be obedient and masters to be kinder and gentler. In Ephesians, Paul speaks directly to the slaves who were in the Ephesian church to listen to their masters as they would listen to Christ. He tells them to work hard and well and to maintain a good will. Paul then speaks to the slave masters in the congregation, telling them to be just as faithful and to not make threats upon them because, Paul says, God doesn't honor a person's station in life. This follows a similar pattern to how the New Testament speaks to church leaders and members, husbands and wives and parents and children. Whenever there is a relationship where there is a 
presumptive power imbalance. The person underpowered is supposed to be faithful and good, and the person in power is supposed to wield power responsibly, fairly, and justly. Each the underpowered and the empowered is to regard the other as if they were Christ. In these sections, the presumptions of power are not called into question, but each party is called to moderation and faith. This is a little odd given Jesus' direct confrontations with the powerful religious elites of his day. Jesus did not defer to them at all. He challenged them over and over again. So what do we do with these texts? Here are three of my ideas. Perhaps you have others. First, as I said a moment ago, these aren't philosophical, theological, political statements on slavery as a whole. If the question had been addressed to Paul, Peter, and the other leaders of the first churches, I don't know what they would have said. I'd hope that Paul's statement in Galatians that there is no longer slave or free would win out, but I don't know. Second, in the church in the first century, it wasn't expecting to be, a la be around that long. They were expecting Jesus to return imminently and that the whole cosmos would come to an end and a new beginning. So they, and we see this especially in the works of Paul, weren't trying to turn the world's order upside down, but were trying to prepare people's hearts and minds for the second coming of the Messiah, whoever they were and whatever station in they had in life. It wasn't until the late first century and early second century that we see the leaders of the churches begin to say to themselves, oh, we're going to be around for longer than we thought. It's only then that we see them begin to build things that were meant to last. And third, I think that the New Testament insistence on the good treatment of slaves is something to take seriously. Even without a call for abolition or general manumission, a call to treat slaves humanely and in a faithful manner is a huge step in the right direction. Remember all that we've learned about the utter brutality of ancient Roman slavery practices. The slaves were considered less than people. They were disposable. You could hurt your slave, use your slave kill your slave. They had no rights whatsoever. A slave master was under no legal or cultural obligation to treat their slave well at all. So Paul calling on Christian slave masters to be kind, humane, and faithful is a huge step in the right direction and would have probably ruffled some feathers 2,000 years ago. 